And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with Robert Salas. Again, his latest book is called UAPs and the Nuclear Puzzle. It's an amazing work, Visitations, National Security, and the Need for Transparency. Where does it all take us next, Robert? What do you think the next agenda is? Uh, You mean uh, the ET agenda or our agenda? (laughs) Probably both. Well, good question. I, I'm hopeful uh, that the ETs have an agenda where eventually we they make uh, very obvious contact with us, and uh, and uh, we work out some deal to work together uh, to, to resolve uh, the many issues we've got, both uh, socially, militarily, and otherwise. Uh, as far as uh, our government goes. I think we're. Uh, I'm really encouraged that uh, there has been some movement in government interest, and uh, uh, that we've got this new. Uh, once the new NDAA is signed, National Defense Authorization Act for uh, 2023 is signed. Um, uh, That'll go into effect next year and require agencies to uh, uh, report back to uh, Arrow, even though Arrow's uh, having its issues right now. But uh, um, basically cooperate with uh, the office under DOD that's uh, collecting UFO information and uh, and um, hopeful that that will happen. That's that's the big problem right now. I'd like to see more open hearings mm-hmm. from witnesses like myself uh, and others. Um, and I think that will uh, uh, bring a more the public involved, public involvement and media involvement uh, in this subject to push for more disclosure. So. Uh, I'll, I'll be working towards that, hopefully. Good for you. Uh, yeah. Robert, prior to the episode, prior to this thing at Malmstrom, were you a believer in ETs? No. Like I said, I I hadn't really thought about them much. I, of course, I read accounts in the local newspaper about lights in the sky, and, uh, and uh, really I uh, didn't give it much serious thought. At the time. But it is now one of the most amazing cases, the entire episode of what they've been doing to us. Yes, yes, I, I think so. And uh, and that's why I've stuck with it uh, all these years. Let's go to the phones, Bill in Los Angeles, to get us started. Hey, Bill, go ahead. Oh, hi, Robert and George, and a happy Veterans Day to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, bro- yeah, Robert. Uh, and by the way, my my dad was in the uh, uh, Army Air Forces during World War II, so uh, I I can relate to some of the things you're you're talking about as a as a veteran. And I'm a former corporate newspaper writer, Columbia J School '86. And during the last three years, uh, I've been kind of a latecomer to this story, but I've been looking at it as objectively as possible. And stories like yours, I mean, you're really the typical reluctant witness, which adds credibility. To everything you say, and you've, you've got people to back you up, and you've got no no motivation to, to lie about this stuff. And uh, along with that, there, there's just other corroborating evidence. And it, it seems that our government has known since Harry Truman first acknowledged flying saucers on TV back in 1950 that we've been visited and or monitored by something. And these things defy conventional physics with these these incredible speeds since 1952 that have been documented on by, by radar operators, both military and civilian. And I, I wonder, Robert, when you when you hear these civilian so-called scientists and these debunkers like Seth Shostak and Adam Frank and Robert Nemiroff say things as they have recently on on this program. Oh, it was a computer glitch. Oh, the FLIR video probably wasn't working right. Oh, you can't trust radar to tell you anything. When you hear these people make these outrageous claims that you can't trust the military equipment or the operators like you to be doing their jobs right and giving information, how do you react to that? Good question. Well, Thanks. the thing that comes to mind is do your homework, for God's sake. Uh, you know, at least take a look at the evidence 
that I have presented to the public. And like I said, anybody can go to my website, spiralgalaxy.org. They can see a lot of the evidence there. I've got documents uh, in my book, uh, uh, Faded Giant, the first book I wrote. Uh, I, I, collect, I had collected uh, quite a few documents from the Air Force under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, and uh, part of that is uh, an explanation uh, or an attempt at an explanation of what occurred by the Air Force. The Air Force uh, was doing a study uh, or many studies on this. Uh, so there, there is documentation they can look at before they start uh, making these statements uh, of non-credibility. Um, so I'm, uh, I'm open to uh, any of them uh, at any time uh, having a discussion uh, about uh, how uh, how this occurred, why this occurred uh, in, in in the technical areas as much as I can, um, and as much as uh, I can reveal, of course. Uh, uh, so um, that's my first uh, comment. Um, yeah, uh, I'll give you another example. We just had. Um, this incident, uh, I mean, this um, presentation in Mexico City uh, on the uh, Nazca mummies. I know this is going into another area. That's a great story, though. But it's a great story. And uh, I listened to the actual scientific presentations uh, uh, back in 2018. I went to Peru just for that. And uh, and uh, I was blown away by, by the science. Uh, not just you know commentary or speculation or uh, it was the science and I I have a lot of interest in science uh, I've got advanced degrees and uh, and uh, then uh, they followed that up uh, with this this uh, recent one in Mexico City with uh, more scientists from the university one of the main universities in Peru um, now. Uh, Prior to that, we had uh, a famous astronomer uh, come on uh, media and say that, you know, he wanted to uh, see the, the science behind these claims, and, uh, and he hadn't even uh, reviewed what's already been done. So that's what I would encourage uh, people that are skeptics of this phenomenon of this particular incident or whatever, uh, take a look at what's already been uh, presented. Let's go to Robert in New York. Take it away. Hey, Robert, you're on with Robert Salas. Well, thank you very much, George. It's a real honor to speak to the gentleman and always an honor to speak with you. Thank you. And I have a couple of eyewitness sight sightings that I'd like to share. And I do recall, as I told Tommy, I... Actually, as a researcher, uh, we had a group of engineers a number of years ago that met uh, on uh, exactly what uh, the guest is speaking about uh, tonight, and also uh, having the privilege of uh, astronaut Ed Mitchell being a friend of the family. There were things that, uh, as the guest uh, can't reveal, there were things that uh, he uh, was not uh, at liberty to make uh, public at large, but uh, sometimes uh, uh, he had an opportunity to speak uh, over uh, dinner and so forth. But in any case, uh, the uh, one sighting I, and, and again, having uh, heard the guest uh, broadcast uh, with Art Bell was a real, real uh, eye opener that I never forgot. And uh, so on that same note, there was a, back in 1957, there was a or, well, a large sphere, orange and, and with a kind of a silver glow around it. It didn't illuminate like a normal light would do, but it just sta stayed within its circumference. And it was huge, and it hovered for hours over a, a 1812 military uh, cemetery 
uh, over over this ravine that was behind this cemetery that was built on a knoll uh, for many, many hours. And I recall coming down, this was called Seneca Turnpike uh, in the West Seneca Turnpike, heading in uh, central New York and Syracuse, New York. Uh, and this globe, there was maybe 15, 16 cars. That, and it was a very steep hill, very, very steep hill, uh, where oh, there was a off the shoulder, there was room to park cars, and there must have been 15 or 16 cars there that were stopped. And I recall my grandfather driving his car, a Chevy, and and all of a sudden the dashboard was flickering, flickering, and it, and it stalled out right on the hill. We had no choice but to park over by the guardrail and the curb there, just beyond the, by the ravine. And what happened was that was there for hours, but it completely shut down the electronics in the car, and then we started talking to other people that were parked there. Why this is unusual that people would be parking there, but everybody's electric uh, system in their vehicles was literally shut down, and this hovered there for hours, and then uh, eventually it got a little smaller, a little smaller, smaller, and it just slowly faded away into the darkness, and that was something that was an impression on my mind that I never forgot, but it was never completely explained. But uh, after it left, uh, we were able to start the vehicles again, and the electronics came back on. And I remember looking at my watch at the time, and even my watch had stopped. The, the watch on the car uh, had also stopped and was uh, delayed because when the power was off, of course. So in any case, uh, I would be interested in the guest uh, view about electromagnetics uh, in that uh, area. And also, uh, it, uh, another case, I had a number of years later, 1967, I had a up close and personal face to face contact with an orb, and there were several that were in the sky, and but they were smaller, they were yellow, and they did not. They did. They glowed, and they sometimes intermittently went off and on. And they had definitely could take uh, right angle turns, and they up, and, and they seemed to have some form of intelligence behind them. It wasn't just, uh, you know, um, heat lightning or anything like that. It was very much guided uh, direction of coming from high in the sky, and then five or six of them came down, and they came down in a cluster. Then one came around the building and then flashed right in my face in the window, nose to nose. Well, Robert, you know, like right, the movie of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Richard Dreyfus was in his truck and all his power went out. That happens a lot, doesn't it? Yes, uh, and, and I've had reports from uh, uh, security guards, um, you know, that I've communicated with uh, where that has happened. Uh, so I, I think what you're saying, Robert, is uh, um, very credible uh, because uh, certainly there have been many reports uh, where uh, these objects have, seem to be able to shut down the electronics of uh, automobiles and, and aircraft also. Robert, are there other cases of missile silos from other countries being shut down? Well, yes, uh, uh, you've um, probably heard of the incident uh, in, uh, actually, this was in Ukraine in uh, 1982 at a missile site. Uh, UFO came over and actually started the missile launch, launch sequence, uh, but shut it down before, of course, it, it was able to launch. It was also um, something like that. Um, uh, uh, there have been other cases in the U.S. I know, um, uh, let's see, I'm, I'm trying to think of the exact location, but uh, one of the witnesses that presented in uh, 2013 at the National Press Club uh, also talked about UFOs coming over and, uh, 
not quite shutting down the missiles, but uh, they were getting uh, spurious signals that they were about to shut down uh, in the capsule as these objects came over. So, yeah, I think they've demonstrated many times that this ability to uh, shut down. First time caller, Sherry in Indiana is with us now. Go ahead, Sherry. Hi. Um, that gentleman, yours, his name is Robert. My husband's name was Robert. Well, how about uh, coincidence, which there aren't any. It's synchronicity. <laughs> well, my husband was Air Force. Why not my not? Right? Yep. <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm talking about. And I get all his records. I cannot believe this. Sleeping tonight, I woke up and I couldn't believe what you were talking about. And I thought, oh my Lord, this is, that's where my husband was. And he was um, a ballistic, uh, I have the paperwork right here, because <laughs> he died on me, that stinker. <laughs> but um, S A E M R and then A F I can't I can't see very well anymore. Well, did he ever talk about the cases from Minot, Sherry, of uh, UFOs or anything? <laughs> to a point, he did. He was a missile. A missile specialist. In other words, you know how you you, you got the the ground, <laughs> and you, the missile goes down, and you go down with it. <laughs> and I'm not saying it probably correctly because it wasn't ever in military, but he he worked on the warheads, and and and, and yeah, he he said there's a there's no trees up there. Nothing. Well, that's intriguing. Uh, how many cases happened at Minot? Just the one time, uh, Robert? Uh, no, I, there was another case. Uh, of course, the case I told you about happened in September of 66. And then there was another one in 1968. Um, and uh, that has also been uh, highly documented and uh and there were 12, at least 12 witnesses to the, uh, I may be wrong about that number, but a, a, a B-52 crew uh, uh, coming back to land was ordered to go around uh, by a general officer and look at this missile site. And this crew saw this object, uh, by the way, this UFO was, uh, was harassing this B-52 for uh, an hour or so, but then uh, saw it land next to this uh, missile site. And later when the crew landed, um, the general informed them that uh, the fence uh, at this launch facility had been crushed and uh, the lid or the cover uh, over the missile itself, the missile silo had been removed. Now that's a 20-ton cover. That's amazing. Uh, We're going to come back and take final calls with you, Robert, in a moment on Coast to Coast. And welcome back to Coast to Coast. George Norrie with Robert Sellis. Robert, about how many military folks do you think spotted the UFO that night at Maelstrom? Well, like I said, we had uh, about six guards, security guards upstairs, um, uh, so I, you know, they all spotted it. I'm, sh I'm sure of that. Uh, and, and I got a call back the next morning, uh, for them to asking me to come out to see them. And, uh, there was a whole group of them there. Um, I, and I'm sure the, the word got around the, uh, barracks that evening, uh, uh, because they all wanted to, <laughs> talk about it. Oh yeah. And of course, I could I couldn't do that. That, that really killed me. Not what, what was it like? Sleep. What was it like going to sleep that night, knowing what you knew? Well, yeah, I, I was very confused, I guess, and unsure what 
just what had occurred. Uh, uh, all kinds of things were going through my head. I'm sure I had trouble sleeping that night. But, uh, yeah, couldn't talk about it. Couldn't talk to my wife about it. Uh, and uh, I didn't for some years. Seven years later. Yeah. Wow. Let's go to the phones. Joe in Long Island, New York. Hey, Joe, go ahead. Yeah, hi, Rob. It, uh, just for the people that don't know, like myself, as much about the technology uh, involved with these things, so I run through a couple of things. Uh, do these missiles, uh, the conventional ICBMs, explode on impact only, or will they explode in the air? Uh, these Trident nuclear submarines, how are they delivering uh, these missiles, if that were to happen, does that go air-based, sea-based, or, or multiple potential ways of delivering that? Uh, with the hydrogen bomb technology, which is supposedly so much more potent than what was dropped on Hiroshima, how much of that was tested? Uh, and does, like, for example, when... The guy from Korea says we might use nuke nukes. Does that divert attention away from other people that might use them but just aren't saying it? Now, on the reactors, what could be the potential if a lot of them either had an accident or were attacked anywhere where they are, given what happened with just one reactor in Chernobyl? What's the potential carnage for the nuclear reactors as well? As far as the submarines are concerned, Joe, the missiles are in tubes ready to launch all over the place. Go ahead, Robert. Yeah, well, as far as the weapon that I was monitoring um, at the time in 1967, uh, and I'm not revealing any classified information here. I got this from public information. Uh, it had about an 800 kiloton uh, nuclear weapon. Uh and uh, for comparison, the, the nukes that were used over Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, were um, uh, about 20 kilotons of uh, uh, equivalent TNT. Um, so we had much more powerful weapons. We have tested hydrogen bombs. Uh, those are megaton range uh of uh, kill, uh, you know, megatons of TNT range, so even uh, much more powerful than uh, they are the most powerful weapons that we, we possess. Uh, the Russians also possess hydrogen uh, bombs. Um, uh, these bombs, um, and Hiroshima and Nagasaki, I think the Hiroshima bomb was an airburst. Airburst, uh, and uh, the one in uh, Nagasaki was a ground burst or close to the ground. Um, but they both wiped out uh, a thousand human beings um, in, in each case. Um, and so we had uh, close to a quarter of a million people die eventually from uh, either the initial blast or radiation burns later on. Yeah, uh, These are very, very powerful weapons. Uh, uh, I don't, uh, did I answer all, all your questions? Well done, Rich. Well done, Robert. Let's go to Cornelius in Louisiana. Hello there, Mr. White. Hey there, George and Robert. I salute both your services, the Navy and the Air Force. George knows I'm an old Army military police officer, Robert. And I was just telling Tommy, I also worked as a federal security officer at Oakdale One, a federal prison here in uh, Louisiana. My dad was in the Air Force at England Air Force Base, which was a tactical fighter base, which is not too far from Shreveport, where Barksdale Air Force Base, our nuclear bomber base with the B-52s. And um, I wanna say one thing about this too. Now you worried about nukes with us, but our enemies have nukes, and if we don't have them, then they'll destroy us. Russia, China, uh, Iran, the communism, Marxism, and socialism 
hates God. And the one thing we have on our side, Israel and the U.S., is God. So we need the nukes to protect us. If you read the Bible, one angel killed 200,000 men. So I think the angels have a whole lot more power than we do, which you would call them the aliens and stuff. But my point is on this, Robert, and I'll, I'll ask you this. When I was at the uh, Federal Bureau of Prisons, I, like I said, as a security officer, because I saw this personally, I told Connie Willis, that one of the guest hosts, that's on coast. I saw a UFO beam a shining light in the forest. It picked up a cow. So these things, whatever they are, aliens or fallen angels, there's something that they're looking at, just like we study animals and stuff like that, and we experiment on animals. So I don't think they're any good. And we can't destroy them, but they can destroy us. So, like I said, I, I just think that um, we need to think about this stuff, but I believe in being armed up to the teeth, whether you have guns or nuclear weapons, because that's the only thing that can protect us against communism, Marxism, and socialism. So God bless you, George. God bless you, Robert. I wonder, Robert, if uh, there was a potential of nuclear attacks from various nations if these UFOs would get involved with all these countries at the same time. What do you yeah. think? Uh, well, I, I hesitate to speculate uh, whether E.T. would get involved. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I, I do think they believe that this is a highly prized, planet because of the diversity of life we have uh, and, uh, on this planet and uh, they would they are here I think to try to help us uh, but I do want to comment to the uh, point that uh, the caller was making uh, I certainly do not believe in unilateral disarmament uh, if we're going to disarm completely or abolish nuclear weapons it would have to be uh, a joint venture of course and then how do you trust them robert how do you trust them well we were able to actually during um uh, what was called um uh let's see what was the name of that salt not the salt treaty the uh, the last treaty we had with russia we did have inspection criteria where we would inspect uh, their facilities uh, nuclear weapons facilities, and they would inspect ours uh, in order to maintain this limitation. I think there was a 1,500, uh, uh, you know, operational nuclear weapons uh, limit for each side. This, you know, this was the uh, I forgot the name of that treaty, but it, it was the one under the Obama administration that was uh, promulgated uh, and signed between Russia and the U.S. Uh, but it, one of the objectives stated in that treaty was in the eventual working towards the eventual abolishment of all nukes. But now we're in a completely different situation. Uh, Russia has rejected that treaty, and I'm sure they're not allowing any inspections on their end. And uh, uh, we aren't with Russia anymore on 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 that treaty. So. Uh, that's been set aside, uh, uh, but we still have the threats. So, uh, like you say, we're we're getting from uh, from North Korea, uh, and who's to say that Iran uh, cannot uh, build a weapon very quickly? Um, there are other nations. For example, I know there was negotiations with Saudi Arabia to uh, exchange. Uh, um, information on, on nuclear power plants. Now, nuclear power plants, as what many people know, um, uh, have uh, radioactive rods that are used to run the plants uh, and create heat and steam for uh, nuclear or electrical uh, generation. Uh, but those uh, rods uh, eventually uh, uh, are 
are removed and become nuclear waste. And that nuclear waste is another major issue because it can still be used uh, to produce dirty bombs, right? That's right. Was in the wrong if in the wrong hands. Uh, was the treaty called New Start? Yes, thank you. Yeah, the that New Start that. Treaty. Uh, uh, so we have made inroads in the past to at least try to get to the point of of abolishment or zero nukes, uh, but it's going to take. An enormous effort, a worldwide effort, uh, and many, many years to accomplish such a thing. But I certainly don't uh, agree with the idea of unilateral disarmament. Okay, more calls. Let's go to Sherry in Indiana. Hi, Sherry. Go ahead. I agree with what he said, and I, I, I am all for if you can, if you can fire a gun. Uh, then that's how to live. I mean, I hate to say this. This is so stupid. But we we got a peeping Tom around here, and I <laughs> that's kind of funny. But I don't have my husband anymore, and because he was in the military, he knew how. You have to if you're in the military. And you you can shoot a gun. I mean, you're going to be a good shooter. And I got all this written down. I got his DD-214, and I'm sure that Robert knows that. Um, it, it just means that you are able to do your due diligence, at, basically. And if I live by myself, then I have to protect myself. And ain't nobody going to be coming around here. If they get in this house, then they're going to be in trouble. Well, just be careful, Sherry. Just be careful. A couple moments left here. Robert... What do you do next? Any events or committees or conferences? Uh, I have uh, no nothing planned yet. I, I expect to be invited to more conferences in the future, uh, but I don't have anything planned at this point. Robert Salas, where do people get your book, UAPs and the Nuclear Puzzle? Yeah, they can order it on Amazon.com, uh, or they can go to my website, spiralgalaxy.org, order it there. Uh, I'm also on uh, audio audiobooks, um, and so it's uh, on Audible also, uh, so people can uh, order it there um, and just listen to it, uh, you know, as they're driving. Um So there are many places to uh, access my books. Robert, thank you so much for being, uh, I will call you a hero. Uh, Enjoy Veterans Day, my friend, for your military service. And uh, what a quite an episode, huh? Thank you, George. I really appreciate this uh, talking to you and and your uh, audience. And uh, I wish you well. Take take care of yourself, Robert Sullivan. So, and again, friends, the name of the book, it's, It's a fantastic read that many of the players we've had on this show have commented on the book in the book. UAPs and the Nuclear Puzzle by Robert Sellis, former U.S. Air Force captain, nuclear missile crew commander, who many, many years ago witnessed something at Maelstrom Air Force Base that he'll never forget. For Dan Galanti, Tom Danheiser, Lisa Lyon, Lex Lonehood, Sean LaDesour, Stephanie Smith, Chris Burles, Tim Banal, Liam Punnett, and George Knapp. I'm George Norrie, somewhere out there on Coast to Coast AM. We'll see you on our next edition. Until then, be safe, everyone.